At the age of 14, over the past five years, Bishop, British paraglider Theo Walden has literally soared to the top of the sport. I had to go ahead and make myself a big cup of English breakfast tea for this one and I recommend you do the same. Well, in this video, in this chalk talk, we will first discuss the, the origins of the sport. And Mark will share his perspective in regards to is this really a French sport? Is paragliding really a French sport? And then we'll transition into you know equipment and more specifically wings. We'll compare to Asterion from 1987 with Theo Warden's current wing and similarities and differences between them. And slowly but surely, we'll transition into thermaling, and and Theo will share his kind of nuance, but also fundamental, you know, uh, uh, ideas behind thermaling. And no matter your skill level, I think you you will gain a lot of value uh, out of this talk. And at the end, we'll finish it off with uh, with Theo actually getting onto the harness and going over a do's and tones of, uh, of turning and maneuvering. So, super excited, get super fucking pumped for this one because it, it is an awesome video. My, my personal biggest takeaway from this chalk talk was, well, you know, prioritizing glider stability, but along with that kind of accepting that no matter if you're if you're a veteran or a beginner, you know chaos will present itself uh, in this sport, uh, and you have to be ready mentally, physically, emotionally to to deal with that. And Theo will talk about his uh, one of one of his um, escapades, the, the adventures in Turkey, where you know the Turkish military had to come and get him. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of cool tips and tricks that will improve your game and and definitely you know add on to your toolbox of flying being the best flying jungle cat you know well without further ado ladies and gentlemen and my Eskimo brothers enjoy on YouTube, but let's see what she says here. David Barish. There's the sail wing. That's the picture I know. Now that's probably an imitation, but that was the first uh, a pair of, uh, right, uh, a replica. There you go. This is at, uh, you recognize it? It's at, that's it. And that's held every September uh, in uh, about an hour and 10, 20 minutes or more from NC beautiful place to go. So anyways, let's just see if we can see it. There's the, the track and back. David Barish started his flying career in 1939, born, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, if we followed this down, the first sail wing was single surface, rectangular shape, made it with three lobes. David Barish, 1966. NASA wouldn't buy a double surface 
better glide that's why in 1966 we progressed to the final version okay so there you go now you know it was not Musi France and that was written for years and then and that's why they called him the forgotten father um, full credit and but who did we really who, we, who did we credit with the first design that got the hang line the regalo wing that was come on I don't know his first name, his last name. Francis Wow. Okay, okay. Well, that's, uh, I guess that's not so important. <laughs> every, every hang glider during my term, I kind of started in 80. And, uh, oh, that's right, you were born in. I'm uh, sorry? 99. 99. Okay, all right. So um, anyway, so Francis Regalo started it, and um, because they were trying to land the spacecraft, you know what I mean, and then uh, and, and try to make the land a uh, uh, landing. Basically, as I remember, I think they just decided too much effort of time to land in water. And that's why they had three, the three rounds. And um, so uh, and when I went around with, uh, 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 I was in Australia in '88, and. Uh, uh, Fred, uh, John Harris was down there, John Harris of Kitty Hawk Heights. They are the very big in the United States. They are the cornerstone. This is just not, I'm, uh, because you guys have got, got empty whiteboards on this, I'm just throwing a little bit more to see this exists. But um, John Harris, even today, is responsible for the in these Kitty Hawk Heights. He bought Morningside Flight Park, so he has the 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 the, 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 uh, the north, uh, the southeast, and the and the north uh, east with uh, that, but those guys are holding together the insurance in this uh, in, in, in all this hang gliding paradigm. Otherwise, what little sites would, would fall. But um, I went down to show them this new thing called Parapont, and, um, and uh, they were not so interested. He said, come on down, I'll make it worth your while. Well, he didn't. And I was broke, you know, and, and, and going from place to place, and uh, but the only guy who did come out was Francis Regalo. And three days in a row, he called and he pulled out his little big pictures around somewhere, his little his little prototype for NASA, and um, and uh, that was his first look at a commercial paraglider. Hmm. And it might well have been. I'm trying to remember. Is this the actual one that, that I had, or did somebody give this to me and I was enthralled? And it, it, you know that. Uh, but that looks that is the original bag. So this was his first look. Uh, and uh, their versions did start out single surface. And, and it's something that here we are 40 years later, and now they're going to single skin again. You know, all the way around. Have you flown single skin? Yeah, just once, but it's weird. <laughs> I have not, and I'm just going to watch you guys on all these new novelties, we'll call it. Yeah. So e and even as we look at this, you're getting your, your, your juices flowing here. And some, but as long as you guys look at me compl completely quizzical and so forth, I'll, I'll go just a hair more. I don't want to bore you. I'm just soaking it up. <laughs> so, uh, but this is, this, this, what you're looking at here without, uh, you know, stiffeners, and you see how, <coughs> how much drag you can imagine this floating through space was, you know, this was considered a jump up on what was being manufactured by uh, John Bouchard in, in the Northeast. So, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, of course you, you can see, the, you can even see what the suspension is about. There's no sheathing there. This is a, I don't know, what is that? A dynamo? Like I'm landing at a rave. Yeah. Well, yeah. They were packed, yeah. they were packed yeah. like parachutes, like, you know, like so. And then, uh, you know, and then I tried to impress you. This is not, doesn't, I don't know how, I'm going to suggest that this was in the late 90s, but uh, you can see what the Russians were doing. So that was, that was kind of, uh, kind of neat. Um, uh, the, the, it's not like the space race for power gliding. There's like a, <laughs> it's like the space race for power gliding. There's a bit of a competition going on. This is like Europe. This is. I think they were broke. So, um, so there you go. Well, that's and Mark, kind of real quick, can you comment on their risers and their whole setup? It's they, you it's know what they much they were just damn the torpedoes. We are going to fly something that has a configuration that they must have been copied. So of I see. course it's, they got they got super substandard by what by, by what we're looking at. So anyways, does that? Uh, so we're gonna try to get him talking because now we jump all the way to from. 
this Asterion really didn't turn. I came from a hang gliding background, and uh, and uh, Pierre Bouillou, your, your super guy there, uh, at least in Pierre's sphere, when we were throwing students off and not knowing anything, I kind of walked into a common thermal, and in hang gliding we did that, and I turned this, and maybe, who knows, gained two or 500 feet, but it was so lethargic and not really known that he called up the French Federation and said, we'd seen a, seen a paraglider thermal and go up. I mean, it was that, uh, what you guys do now, climbing up, uh, was not known. These things, and maybe you're going to fly it, and you would not want to be presumptuous <laughs> that it turns. You know what yeah, I mean? I, just, I mean, and, and I was kind of chuckling when I was uh, telling Ron about this because I don't bring this out. You know that you, you guys brought it out, but I was thinking that just kind of turning over the top of a mountain and something that could just stop flying, like your your little gig there where that inside wing went. Mm -hmm. Sorry to go, but but you, it's fresh in your minds. That's the nature of a wing that you know isn't wasn't happy to turn, and these were this way. And when I think of, frankly, I, I, I could have been paralyzed from that day on, not knowing what to do if it turned and stalled. And, and you weren't protected. This was state of the art. Everybody wore this, um, and uh, that was it. Everybody Whether, broke their back the same way. <laughs> it was that way, and and so uh, hence that's where it was. So now. When we turn to superhero here, and he's about to show. Yeah, I was going to go over. Yeah. Th there you go. What a great segue. Oh. Yeah. I was going to go over like the, the difference, you know, you know, old and modern. Like, has everyone seen like the new competition? Like, it's, uh, it's a show yeah, do. yeah, come around. So this is like my brand new wing. Uh, How much can well, I touch it? I'm sure you didn't. Now, what does a brand new wing like that cost, though, to the, I think they retail to the normal pilot? I think they retail around five and a half thousand. Um, it hasn't even been unfolded yet. No, it's like literally brand, brand new. <laughs> no, I just smell it. Yeah, look at I was going to say, <laughs> look at that. Oh, so, yeah, right. Can I roll and, around? And, and look, at, look at the length on the, on the, the cord there from, from tip to, to stern. What's the size? Uh, so this is a small, but yeah, it's a 21. What yeah. is it? Um, it's an Enzo 3. 105, right? Uh, yeah, 105. Yeah. So if you like, just look at the cell opening, you can have like... Yeah. These ones. Oh, yeah, yeah like, you could like, climb this thing and have like, a good night's sleep. Enzo 3, how many cells? Um, not less than 100. I think it's like 70. 103? Uh, less than 100. Less than 100? Yeah, less than 100. And you have to look at the inside. Like, this thing has no structure. You look down in the center of the cell. There's nothing in there, but you look down here, and there's cross ribbing. There's like through through like cell ribs. There's all these straps, which basically basically mean the whole wing is like stays a lot more rigid. You know, this wing's like an aspect ratio of um, seven or seven point five or something. Um, so yeah, yes, you, you don't have as much um, span bias cohesion of the wing that's you know short and stubby like a, an ENA. Uh, so yeah, you need like a lot more structure. And I mean, look at this. You've got like Milo in there too, but you've also got like all these rods. Yeah, it's just sexy. And these rods extend how yep. far? The whole way of the wing. Yeah. Top and bottom? Top and bottom, they go all the way. Oh. Yeah. It won't collapse. Hi, yeah, it's just it's amazing. <laughs> Stiff. And like, it's actually quite funny. So like, you know, modern wings, ENA, BC, they all have like three line of designs, right? But this one has like a two line of design. Like, it's, like, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty cool. That's what we work to now, so these are the risers. Well, how's the risers on the on that one, the the retro one? Yeah, so they actually have a two kind of riser design. There's more lines going See. up, like suspension that cascade into like you know the um, the upper cascades. But yeah, if you look at these risers, and there's like not much to them. Yeah, if you want to like just have a look. Yeah. So yeah, you've uh, you've got your A's and you've got your B's. Yeah. And they cascade. You've got like these called A B's. What is that? Uh, what is that wooden <laughs> thing like? Is it, is it just so that's just, have a better that's basically just hold on to because like half the time you're on speed bar, so you want to be on those bees to be able to like affect the angle of attack and make sure that the collapses are reduced. Is this came with it or you yeah, yeah, that, it? Yeah, that comes that comes with every design basically. They've got like a full handle. Interesting. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, you're you're like this. 
you know, like that. And then this thing here is like a limiter. It basically oh. stops the amount that you can pull down the speed bar. Um, and this is like a, a certified length. Yeah. The speed bar range is pretty small. On these? I think it's like, no, yeah, speed bar, right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's like 15. Yeah. It might be like certified, but it's 15 and not. No, I think it's 15 overall. Yeah, basically this, this blue tab, this is like, it's certified up to this point, and then after oh. that point, it's not certified. Oh, oh it is. So it's like, it's, it's kind of like at your own risk. Oh, oh, your own risk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, elaborate on that, what does that mean? Like, if you keep pulling it, it might collapse? So basically, it might yeah, just when eat like, itself? Well, no, like, no, no, no. We know it's safe, because they're, they're tested, but like, they're not certified. So like, the test pilots who make this ozone, they, um, they'll like do all the testing on all the range. But when it comes to certification, after this point, it becomes a bit more violent and, uh, you know, unpredictable. Like things, okay. things can go a little bit harder. So yeah, like, they don't- that point all the time though, right? Yeah, okay. basically, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you go up to this point, it's all, you know, EN tested, you know what's gonna happen and still calm air. And then after that point- So, so the, your, this slider is EN tested? It's EN tested, but the way it's EN tested, they just do like one size, and then they self-regulate, they self-test the, the rest of the sizes. So I think they do like the medium, and then they they um, they produce their own test results for the And they're rest giving of the it an EN. It's CCC. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that's why you've got all this stuff like you know it's not certified after this point when you do. Yeah, the, but if you're if you're flying a wing at that caliber, why would they even do that? I mean, you know already that mm, what you're flying. Yeah, it's true. You know, they have, they, I mean, it's like because, oh, because, oh, oh, there's the blue tape. I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs> yeah, 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 there was a big right. problem with depth, and yeah. and uh, and they had to reel back. Uh, I think if you're on 30, uh, most of the kilometers an hour, it's like 36, 37, around that. Kilometers, then, right? Yeah. Kilometers. So. Okay, so so let's just do that. And, and, and the interesting factor about uh, trim, uh, so 37, what are we claiming an ENA is doing? I mean, I always kind of... Uh, I always kind of think that we're. Uh, I have a thought, but go ahead. Yeah, I think like yeah. I think we're trim speed we're like almost comparable. Exactly. And yeah, exactly. Pretty much exactly the same. But it's just when you get on that speed bar, that's where you really get the the difference in speed because of that high aspect ratio. It really it really cuts through the air. It just, just so 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 I I and, and so where I want to kind of take this and it's kind of funny. To, I feel like we're speaking basics. You know, where the where the start. You know. Yeah. And now uh, so you know, kind of a common uh, misnomer is that everybody's thinking, oh, you know, I, I want to, well, you were even talking yeah. about your Delta going yeah. so much faster. Like and, uh, and frankly, for 40 years, if these fighters were always going faster, like the promotions say, we'd be at light speed now, but they're not really increasing so much. Of course, a little bit there. But interesting fact, trim speed is within a mile an hour of each other between a high-end glider. And that just means hands off, best launching, best turning, uh, you know, for thermal is they're all at trim speed. For the most part, you don't find yourself coming up on a student and saying, I'm passing on the left. It doesn't happen. Take yeah. note. No, no, it's actually a, a really good point you made there. It's like, you don't want it to be faster, especially in trim, because when you're climbing, why do you need that extra speed when you're trying to be at min sync to get up as fast as possible? It's like in competitions, your, your whole game is to outclimb people. That's where you really make a big difference. So like, hmm. Having any kind of speed over someone is just going to get going to get drilled. Yeah. So then, um, question about the, the two liner. Is yeah. that Primarily because of line drag or is it a stability thing? It's a it's a good mixture of both. Okay. So like the line drag definitely helps. I mean, you can see down at the bottom. You know, you feel the line that's all right. Yeah. yeah, that's like takes away a lot of the, um, the line drag. And also um, being able to have control of the angle of attack, basically on each side. Whilst you're on the speed bar, it means that you can actually you're not, you're not just changing the shape of the profile when you're like you know pull on the rear rises if you've got like a three liner or a four liner design. You're actually changing the angle of attack so you can you know you just fly more efficiently. So the yeah. three liner, you're you're actually collapsing. Right. You're bending your yeah. You, and you, try, you change that camber at the back. It's almost like pulling the brakes. Just a lot of different. So with the two liner, you're not. Yeah. You're you're yeah, you're angle of attack. You're literally just. It's yeah. almost like adding and taking away speed yeah. bar like, the whole time. It's just. Instant, you don't need to move your legs. That's it. That's why I, I, I want to just sweep back that basic though, so that y you guys can disseminate and say that the trim speed is not different uh, uh, between, you know, basically this and an A. It's within a mile an hour. Yeah. But you're, but but state your you, and and we'll suggest that your your A glider is going to get. Um, 
three, three, probably in reality, three or four mile an hour. We'd like to say five and six, but it's, it's probably not there. But you estimate your top speed gain over trim is? I, you get at least like 15 to 20 kilometers an hour extra. You say 20, so what's that, about 13? It's, a, it's, it's very, very good. So, so Mitch said, he, he, he said that he, 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 he spoke with uh, uh, clarity that he gets 17 miles an hour more. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was aghast. Yes. Okay, 12 was kind of the number. But he said, and he says he doesn't like to go there. He says when he's on full speed bar, he can't hear his radio. And no, it's true. You can't hear anything. Uh, it's pretty much like yeah. Yeah. you're in your own little bubble and like nothing else around you is really matters. You're just kind of focused on keeping the wing open and making sure you're not going into anyone. Yeah. That's, that's kind of like yeah, the main thing. But yeah, these are amazing, amazing beasts. And like you get a lot of technology that, you know, are implemented in this that are passed down into, you know, lower wing suits. Like everything's getting better. And the, the, I don't know if you guys know about the old Ozo wings, the original two liners. So like, they never actually have, have any of this like bendy plastic. They actually use these carbon rods. Yeah. Yeah. And they, the reason why people were having a lot of um, problems is it would collapse, and like a lot of the rods would just snap. And then you're like, you're stuck in the air with a wing, which is like completely out of shape, poking holes in itself, and ripping itself to bits. Oh my god. And um, yeah, there were just um, there were just a lot of deaths. So the uh, so you, you you spoke of rods versus we're calling this ridgy foil, correct? Um, yeah, we just, I just call them rods. You know, they're just um, it's basically just trimmer wire. You know, you yeah, have to go buy it and like yeah, chuck yeah. it in your way. Oh, really? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. okay, so you were spoken of the original the original ozone. Yeah, the HPB, I think. With and but you're saying same materials, different design. Um, so similar ish design, different materials. So like the um, the carbon rods were like you know they just wanted okay. to do the, there you go carbon yeah. rods versus uh, there, are you now of course you are looking for every millimeter of performance more so you take such great care yeah. in folding, folding and also like I used to work at a service center, so you know I'd be working on my wing all the time um, and you've got when you're flying competitions you've got like a, a range of a range of tolerance in your line lengths. And like the trim is like a huge thing that people will mess around with and they'll try and find their like sweet spot, right? But um, yeah, so you've got plus or minus 10 millimeters. So I don't know how much is it in an inch. But yeah, plus or minus 10. 25 mil in an inch. Yeah. Okay, so like just less than an inch. Four inch. Yeah. And, and basically, like people play with these loops, play with these lines, they'll put loops on the riser end, on like the A's and the B's, to increase or like decrease like um, angle of attack in like different parts of the wing and it really makes a massive difference. Like you'd be surprised how much like five millimeters will actually make to um, to a wing like this, just in you know five meters of line. Like literally like five millimeters, it's crazy. Um, so yeah a lot of people keep their trims very very close to their chest. <laughs> uh, but yeah that's that, that's just kinda of how like sensitive wings are these days. Not so much in the ENA, B and Cs, but um, I don't know if you guys have any kind of like service centers here, but checking out your wings is actually like a good idea every so often. We've got a brand new service center. Right. Uh, it's called Theo in Sarah, uh, Sierra Warden. Yeah. 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 Maybe maybe we could do a day where everyone comes up, they, we all check our own wings and I'll just talk you guys through it. Yeah, because um, the only thing we the only thing we won't be able to do because I don't have the stuff is using a, a laser measurer and actually get the trim. It's not actually that expensive. That's thirty bucks. You can no. buy it. Do you need something more? <laughs> no, no, it's really cheap. Actually, yeah, it's just like finding a setup which is very consistent. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, like, you know, you um, you have to put about five kilos of um, yeah. force on every line, yeah. and once you put five kilos of force on one line, yeah. you do it again. Yeah. It's going to be slightly different in length. So you need it to be like a uniform measurement. Yeah. It needs to be very precise. Yeah. But everything else, like we can check the lines together, we can check the wing, the internal structure, mm -hmm. um, all the stuff that matters. And actually, I was going to talk to you about your wing. Mm -hmm. um, you might have, there might be something on your left here. Oh, you mean uh, the 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 uh, Nivet? Uh, no, no, the no. LM. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. Is it? You know this? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I know that. We have. I was going to ask you. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll we'll do that in a day, and it'll be really productive. Yeah, for sure. How frequently 
uh, you know, on that same note, how frequently should we be getting, like, do, do, is there an interval, like, hey, every year, every three years, it should get sent in and tested, or? So, these wings, like, the ones that I fly, if you fly over 150 hours, you should probably buy a new one. Um, okay. Just because, like, the lines, they lose their elasticity. Mm -hmm. the, um, the fabric can stretch. Um, and generally, they just don't fly as well as they were when they were brand new. Um, what about the wait, ones we The one you guys fly, I'd say like check, check them every 150 hours. I think you can send down an eagle for that laser. I think they re recommend 100 to 150. Yeah, 100 yeah. to 150 hours. That's the whole laser thing. I well, don't know. Generally, all of the gliders, you know, with a certification panel in the middle, yeah. they actually tell you. I don't know where mine is. Just to keep going. The same way, too. Oh, there it is. Yeah, just over here. If you, uh, you go out on your wings and you get the certification panel that says just here, line change every 150 hours. And um, yeah, periodic inspection, one year slash 100 hours. Also, take a photo of it in case your wing is stolen. That's a great way to prove it's actually your wing. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So yeah, that's what I kind of recommend. Any other questions about points and stuff? Can we kind of fold up like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Service yeah. Can you really good. Uh, I think you need like five Vietnamese women. They're pretty amazing. <laughs> when you're when you're in a full nose down spiral, as hard as you can go, how many G forces do you think you're gonna pull? Probably like, <laughs> nose, down. nose down as hard as you can spiral that sucker. I think I think my dad he had like G plus me when he did it once and yeah. he got five point five. Five point five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the wings were rated at what eight? Uh, no, I did you see your dad? Yeah. So your dad was a pilot too? Yeah, yeah, we got to around the same time. Oh, cool. Um so yeah, they actually they're tested to a ridiculously high standard if they're EM tested. Yeah. I think it's like 14 G is what they're like actually wow. low tested to. Anytime I get into one of those where I'm like really cranking it, it's. No, like, you're. God, I hope these lines don't snap. But just <laughs> just <laughs> rip out of my glider. Yeah, no, I think, um, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, I could be wrong, I don't take it as gospel, but they're, they're tested to a ridiculously high standard. Sure. Yeah. And shock tested and like all the rest. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you're putting a, a 5 G spiral, you're yeah, like well within your tolerance. Sure. And that's your line to... Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So speaking of tolerances, uh, we had uh, Yun who uh, found himself totally saturating his uh, END... What is it? Uh, XC, uh, XC Racer. XC Racer, and you uh, estimated it had uh, approximately how many hours? Uh, probably 100, 200. There we are. And uh, if you didn't hear, he uh, went into parachutage and landed on the mountain. Um, so, uh, how do you feel about taking your, your super racer into moisture or clouds or just your basic cloud if you somehow got too close? Yeah. So, like, <laughs> generally, um, it's not a good idea because nylon absorbs water. And when it absorbs water, it, like, that protective coating around the fabric expands. Well, the nylon expands and then pushes apart the fabric. And um, it, creates, it creates holes, so it makes it more porous. Um, so yeah, that's something to watch out for. Nylon rods also expand in humidity, which isn't good. But rain is actually an interesting one. So like, on high performance wings, they found that it's not actually the wing getting wet, which is the problem, like it doesn't help. Uh, but like, because the, uh, the coating on the, the surface is actually hydrophobic, it creates little bubbles of like water, like you know, just little kind of balls of water, heat up. And then they kind of act as turbulators on the wing. So actually, you can actually have like effectively a high speed stall. Mm. And that actually is what puts your wing into, um, into parachutal and the, the weight keeps it there. So like sometimes you can go into parachutal and it drops back and you put your hands up. That, that's exactly what I feel. Yeah. yeah, it drops back and then you're and like... The tip kind of curve. Nothing happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and if the tips touch each other on like highest ratio wings, it's called the kiss of death. Because yeah. uh, yeah. you're probably not going to get it out in any nice configuration. <laughs> We talked about that Tuesday for a while at the P3 study group we did. Yeah, was, we it. yeah, that was super, super knowledgeable. That was all new to me then. Now, yeah. if it, had he uh, stepped on that speed bar would to get the nose down, yeah. perhaps it, 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 it would have taken No, exactly. So like anything that will, anything that will get your angle of attack um, like lower, like lower angle of attack, it will like, help. 
Anything that makes it higher, it'll just mess you up. Like doing big ears in rain, really bad idea. Unless you've like you're instantly pushing on speed bar because all that drag comes in yeah. and it's just gonna knock you straight back yeah. in. It's like pulling brakes. Um, speed bar is good, and if you're actually into a parachute or stall, just pushing your A's or use your speed bar. Push A meaning hold A. You can just out. grab them. Yeah, you can grab them and push them down or out. Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the easier, by the way, would be like this, you know, to, to twist your A's. But if you, hopefully you have your speed bar set up. Yeah. So now when we, so we're speaking about the very narrow tolerance of high-end gliders. How about when we slip down to the, to the, to the high A, uh, low to medium B? Yeah. How much more fudge factor do they have, uh, you know, seeing as we're pointing out moisture and conditions and so forth? Yeah, a lot more. Yeah, they're a lot more forgiving in general. But um, it's interesting, it really depends on the air you're flying through. So like, you know, the best thing you can do, like flying wise for your own skill is go to like an SIV course or, you know, just someone take you over water and like induce stuff that could like happen in, in bad air. And then you get an idea of what's gonna happen. Cause like when you actually get into that bad air, like the reactions could be completely different. But if you have that like basic understanding of the initial input you make, the initial input's like the biggest, uh, it will have the biggest effect on um, you know, your recovery of the wing. Um, oh, the, cascade. the cascading effects. Yeah. Oh, I've actually got a really good video. Let me, uh, let me get this up. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just going to do this. You know, like, you know, normal day, people flying around, hiding in the hill, having a good, you know, thermic day out. This guy pushes, this guy pushes out over the launch, goes over towards the landing. And like, watch how much, watch his wing. Yeah, it's flying normally, pretty low. Not too much break you can't see any deformation on the trailing edge. And I look at that. This is stop. So yeah, he goes, in, goes into a stall. He overcorrects himself, he falls too much break when he recovers. Look how kind of weird it is. Up and down. Yeah. But it wasn't flying because of what you did. No. It was fine because um, well, he just eventually he put his hands up and he, uh, he let him fly. Here, yeah. we'll put yeah. this over here. We'll jump that up here. The wing is smarter. Cool. So, yeah, take a look at this. And like this is a this is a no momentum four. To fly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? SIV four or what did what did you say? Oh no, this is a no momentum four. So oh. this is like um, okay. low B. Like, yeah, like a higher high higher B. And then, if you actually watch, it's almost like a gust storm because, like, it doesn't do any, it doesn't make much of an impact, and it goes straight into the spin. It looks like to the right side of the wings telling them what's about to be happening. You see like, some quivers. But if you look, there's no. He's not pulling on the brakes at all. No. Like, so he's going full, full uh, gym speed. Yeah, uh, so he's not even active. Not, but not loading. Yeah, not. Not uh, on the rear risers either, though. Yeah, I don't. I don't even think he's on ski bar. Might be doing selfies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at all that slack. I was trying to see his risers, but yeah, I don't think he's even on ski bar. He just came from laminaire from the ocean. He has no idea what's about to hit in there. Yeah. Should be defending himself. Oh, totally yeah, we'll go through like his mistakes here. It's quivering on the right. So it pitches back. It does pitch back, and then like it's behind him, and I think he does touch the brakes a little bit, and then instantly goes into a you know a spin slash stall. Hmm. You know, almost does it right. He pulls a little bit too much on the right, spins around, goes into a full stall, and here, did you see? You see how he like he let it dive, which is what he should have done. Which is, that's good. There you go. He let it dive, but he was still pulling a fuck ton of brakes. And that put him straight back into it. Mm. Like once your glider's dived and it's like stopped diving, you can just like release your hand straight back up. So I'm going into like a bit too much detail about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's nice. That's good. Um, yeah. Basically, you know, you come out of that to this. It's, you're about to stop flying. Don't don't be buried in your brakes. Mm. You don't need to. Um, yeah, and then he kind of goes into a little cascade and eventually it comes out. Mm. Yeah, my my point was that. <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> it, it could have been a mixture of between his input and like the air he was flying through, but it can happen on any wing. Like it really doesn't matter what you're flying. Like if you do, if you make the wrong inputs, like you can have 
that alone, instant on this. So when it pitches forward that aggressively, you're supposed to just let go? No, no, so like, so it kind of depends on where the wing is. Okay. So it's all about pitch control, basically. So if the wing's behind you, and, um, okay, the wing, wing's behind you and it's stalled, like, what's the worst thing you can do? I know it is. Anyone else? I have to, to pull brakes. Pull brakes. Yeah. No, no. The, the, just yeah, you want to actually you want to maintain it. You want to hold the brakes in there, because what's going to happen is if you lift your brakes all the way up, yeah. when it's behind you, it's got all of this space to accelerate. Um, so yeah, you want to hold the brakes in, and then you want what's going to happen is it's going to stabilize. You're going to fall back underneath your wing. Once you're yeah. underneath your wing, that's when you can start about thinking to release the brakes. Um, yeah, otherwise you're just going to get a huge pitch and you can end up like, you know, yeah. gift wrapping oh, yourself yeah. and it's not, it's not fun. Uh, so yeah, he actually let it, he let it pitch forward and when it's in front of you and it stopped moving, it stopped accelerating forward, you, you, you can't go any further, like you just have to let your hands up and okay. then it'll fly away. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's generally how to get out of like a high energy kind of messy store. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But always, it's always about that stability. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same in any incident. So like you get an asymmetric, comes in, starts turning you. What do you what do you do first? Lean the other way. Yeah. Lean away. Lean, lean away from it. And if it's still turning you in, it's turning you into that um that spiral, you you just like add a little bit of brake on the flying okay. side. And once you start once you've made it stable, that's when you think about trying to, you know, pump the brake on the other side, get okay. it out. But um, it's always about that stability first. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, it can happen on any way. That's what I was gonna take away from that. Um, so I, I have, um, what is your biggest uh, concern, uh, the, uh, the tragic flaw with your two liner wings? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of said that uh, there's elements of low B, middle B gliders where they're not as stable as your high end Gliders. It's true. So one of the aspects in which, you know, normal school to like intermediate wings are like less stable than ours is uh, spiral dives. So you can actually enter a spiral dive and once it's, you know, like proper spiral dive, you're like facing the floor, nose is going around like facing the floor, right? That's, you can get a thing called lock-in and basically like, the, the, the spiral is like stable and you'll stay spiraling down even if you've got no input on the brakes. Um, and that's actually one of the things designers that find it really hard to like, kind of design out of uh, an ENA or B or C, just because it, it does find that natural like stability whilst it's in that turn. So yeah, if you ever find yourself in a nose down spiral, sometimes you have to like lean away from the direction of turning, and then like add a little bit external brake on the other side. Um, yeah. Otherwise, um, generally these stay open a lot better when you're flying. You know, if you're gonna get a collapse on anything, you're probably gonna get it on an EMBC, whatever. <laughs> These just have so much structure in them that they, they just wanna stay open. Um, but when they do go, it's quite aggressive. Yeah, that's the, the main difference. There's a, um, I know this is going on the internet, there's like a, an analogy, but it's not too friendly to the opposite sex, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go over that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. If you want, I can cut uh, that that's out. That's okay. <laughs> It's gonna be our little secret. Maybe, maybe another time. Do we have a kid here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's like one of the main differences. So um, yeah, any more questions about wings? Mm. What's been one of your like gnarliest collapses or? Yeah. Yeah, talk to us about that. Like, walk walk us through like how'd you react, but also like what were you kind of thinking in process? Uh, I'll even say. Uh, how, uh, have you thrown a reserve out of need? Yep, I have. I was teaching myself acro in Turkey. Um, stupidly on my own with just friends and no rescue boat. So like, I ended up throwing the reserve because I was doing a helicopter, got twisted up, ended up in the drink, and the, uh, the Turkish military had to come and fish me out. Because wow. <laughs> there was so no one else. So you to the sea? But yeah, into the sea. In the sea. sea. Yeah, because I was doing this helico. I've actually got a video of it somewhere, but I was doing this helico, got twisted up, Three more reserve, way too high, should have sorted it out and just had like, you know, two minutes. <laughs> no way I'm going to get wet, there's nothing I can do, hoping someone's going to come pick me up. Where were um, you in Turkey? Yeah, all in there. Yeah, so we were super high, like 2,000 meters, so 6,000 feet. Like, 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 like. 
Um, going back to what you were saying, the gnarliest collapse I had was actually because of something that I did. It was my fault. Um, basically, I was, it was a training day for a competition in the uh, south of France. Um, I'd just gone onto two liners, and uh, my harness basically, it wasn't made for the uh, amount of speed range that these gliders have. So the amount of speed bar you can push on. So I uh, adjusted my harness to uh, kind of make up for this. So the speed bar pulleys are like actual like nuts and the brummel hooks, they go into my harness. Um, so like, I pushed the speed bar on, came off. Oh, oh, not come off. It came off and then one side stayed fully locked on. So I got a fucking huge collapse with a really high angle of like, um, a really high fold angle. So I whipped him around into a, into a spiral and like, yeah, just, it was just trying to fire it to like stay open and flying. Cause like full speed bar on one of these, is just ridiculous on one side. How did you get out of it? Um, I was going into a spiral, I just let go of the brakes and yanked and ripped my harness up and just yanked it out. But uh, yeah. Didn't great. throw the reserve? No, no, no. no it was, that would have been embarrassing. Not that time. <laughs> <laughs> you find the yeah. And another, another like really kind of rubbish time for me was like going around a windy corner, like anywhere like mountainous. You know, you've got the, um, the wind flowing around in the valley systems and if there's like a sharp corner and you're like, you know, the wind's coming this way, the mountains are like, so the wind's coming this way, right? And I'm behind here in the lee side. Coming around this corner, it's just sharp, gnarly air. It's just like, it'll really mess you up. Yeah, so that's one of my other worst collapses. It's just got like, kind of, came into a ball, and you have to just like, kind of hope something's gonna happen. You're just yanking on the brakes and kind of praying. Mm. But yeah, that's one of my worst experiences. And hitting a house, that sucked. Yeah. Hitting a house. Inside of a house. Yeah. Anything else? Go there. What I'm kind of hoping, given that sure, we yeah. have, in theory, we're done here in 40 minutes. Hmm. You know, I, I'd like to hear your basic thermaling tips for success. That will help you. That's relevant. No, definitely. Yeah. Com I was just throwing ideas. Unless really is, I don't see anybody here that is going to be jumping into competition gear. Cool. But what we did see was see the two extremes between competition and uh, a little bit of speak on your ENBs and so forth. So, uh, you know what, I, I, uh, if, if you want to stay here, fine, uh, but uh, maybe we want to sit in those harnesses there. It's uh, either way. Yeah. Okay, if you want to. Quick, quick. Okay, if we're going this way. I'm going to try to assist on the computer here where I can. You want a marker? Yeah. Eraser? Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, so. Do you want to shout it out? No. <laughs> no. Okay. So like, say, say we're like looking above it, right? And we're going to take a cross section of the thermal. What, what can right. you expect to see? Or like, not expect to see, but like expect to experience. What, what's that? Go. 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 Okay. Yeah. That works. Yeah. So like, yeah, if we're doing like cross section, kind of from the ground. Yeah. It's kind of like kind of terrible drawing, but like kind of like that. It's like drawing from a large area, kind of comes together. That's the kind of shape you can expect. Yeah. And then, how about from like looking down from above? Say like you're the cloud looking down. Like, what's like what's going on in here? Any ideas? Is it spiraling maybe? It's probably yeah. spinning in one direction. Yeah. Right. And like I was thinking more of the uh, the idea of like different areas of of lift. Okay. Okay. Stronger in this <laughs> in one area. Yeah. yeah. So where where is it stronger? Center. 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 Yeah. Exactly. So we can actually have like a few different kind of almost layers. Better, uh, oh yes, we learned about yesterday. You like the center more than other people, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very aggressive. We won't, we won't say out that name today. I'm just trying to the pen. Okay, so yeah, you've got these. Um, you can imagine like these. So, um, do you guys work in meters per second here? Like, generally, like how fast you're going down or up? Do you guys kind of understand it? Okay, so basically, when we're flying around normally in still air, we're going down at like one, minus one meter a second. That's like kind of our, our general ascent rate, a descent rate. Um, okay, so we've got a thermal here. On the outside, this kind of area, it's a plus, plus one uh, meters per second going up. Uh, here is plus two, and here is plus three. So um, we're going down to one meter a second. 
this part of the thermal is going up at plus one meters a second. So like, what's our overall net altitude yeah. loss we're getting? Yeah. Say again? Zero. 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 Yeah, yeah, zero. zero. So like, going here, you're going to be zero. It's like, when you're flying through this area of lift, or this area of the thermal, like, you can sense that there's something around. Like, you know that there's something there. You're not in it yet, but like, you know there's something there. Um, and then like, as you go up, in this area, you'll obviously be going up at one. one meter per second, and then this is two meter per second. Um, so when I'm thermaling, say I'm like coming in, coming along like this, you like get into this area of like you know, it feels like zero meters per second. You're just kind of maintaining. Um, I kind of know that there's something around here, so I'm gonna start making a uh, like a kind of wide turn, and I need to decide like left or right. So say like come in, I go out, I drop out of the thermal, so I'm gonna tighten my turn, I'm gonna come all the way back around until like you know I start hitting that like that lift again. And um, once I get into like the stronger parts of lift again, I'm just going to kind of maintain until I start you know going back down, like, all, like relative to what I was before. Let me know if I'm rambling or like you know, trying to get what's in my head into like you know we got the classic saying. So yeah, I go into this like um, kind of like I'm not going up as fast. I'm just maintaining again. So I'm gonna turn back around until like I start hitting the lift stronger again. And basically, you know, you're just trying to like center yourself, you know, going into the lift, out of the lift, until you like kind of get into the stronger parts of the lift, and then you kind of like center yourself into the middle. Um, it looks super messy like this, and obviously, you know, we can't see it when we're up there. Um, but yeah, just searching around, I'm like, I'm kind of creating this like mental map in my head, like the stronger areas, areas of lift are like red blobs in my mind. And if I'm getting like any kind of feeling from the wing either way, I'm kind of like mentally noting that. So say like, you know, I'm turning to my left and um, my right side gets like hit up like a little bit better than my left side does. I've got an idea that it's actually more over to the right hand side. So I'll go all the way around and I'll like extend my turn going into the, um, what I thought was going to be the stronger part of it. You don't turn at the time you feel it. No, I usually I generally don't change my direction because that usually messes up my my mental image of like where the thermal is. Exactly, and I an exclamation point on that. You notice that he did his mapping. Uh, in this case, he started left. He chose to stay left, and rather than reverse direction, he's you know you're almost kind of counting seconds, and and uh, perhaps he'll speak. Uh, with well, that except exception that if you see an ego right there <laughs> and turn it, then you go immediately into it. But yeah, yeah regardless, if, if you only just see the eagle now, you've made an observation error. <laughs> but yeah, so um, but you're right, yeah, if, if there was an eagle just there, I'd just, I guess the right. Yeah. But generally, if I'm flying my own with not many. I noticed in your pattern that in each case, your, turn, your initial turn is away from the lift. Oh no, because I don't know where the lift is. Just okay, so you could have turned towards it too. Yeah, just, it's just, just coincidence the way yeah, you mapped it this So you time. just okay. have to choose the direction. Yep. Sometimes you have no information. Sometimes when you're going into the film, or you're like, the film was trying to push you out, basically, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, because um, say like one side of the uh, wing is in the stronger lift than the other, so it, it rolls you out. So you're kind of going with it, its inclination anyway in this particular map. Oh, well, in this one, yes. But yeah. like, say I didn't have that information, and I'm just like searching because like yeah. this is a big area of, you know, uniform like. But no, not much left at all. Would the, the wing direction influence your left and right? If you're tail wing, then you will, I mean, wing from this side, you will turn to the wing or you will kind of still maintain your tail, tail wing and to the left, if the wing is from your right. Um, okay, so like if I'm going downwind, uh, down, yeah. uh, say it's something like a downwind dash day, yeah. um, I'm coming at it from like, you know, the wind. An angle, right? If yeah, say, so no, say I'm like going straight down, um, you kind of expect if there's any amount of wind on the day, uh, this kind of shape changes a little bit. It actually kind of goes um, more like like this. Um, it's stronger. Yeah. Because like, if you're wow. close enough to the ground that the wind is actually influencing the thermals, you can expect more of this shape because you've obviously got these two separate air masses. Like this is slightly lower pressure, hotter, it's like rising. And then you've got like, the, um, the wind kind of kind of passing around it almost, like slightly, it's very subtle. And you'll almost get like a, you'll get more lift just here because it's like those two air masses almost converge. But that's my idea of it. I don't know if that's actually the case. I've like read a few books and people say like, you know, generally this is what happens in wind. But yeah, if you're doing like a downwind dash day, 
you'll find the strongest area of lift on the upwind side of the thermal. And for Gooky Denim and Dash Day, just, just go for it. Yeah, just like, you know, you, day. we do a lot of them in the UK because we've taken off small hills, like, you know, 300 foot. Mm. You're taking off your saw and you get a film where you go up to the car base and you just you go just for it. Straight yeah, downwind. Okay. Yeah. On days where it's like lighter wind, you'll get like this kind of this kind of configuration. Stronger days you get like that. Um, and yeah, on stronger days it can actually be harder to kind of like find that thermal and say, or the the core at least is um, it's just a little bit more like not not what you expect it. It's not perfectly shaped. So Theo, um, how fast? Like once you find the core, yeah, uh, how fast? Um, your 360s usually, do you, do you try to count, count it? I think Ian told me if I recall correctly, was it 12 seconds, 7 seconds, I can't, I can't 7 remember. seconds is a seven tight second. turn, okay. yeah 12 seconds is more, more natural, like you won't right. be banking as hard. Well let's say when you're competing versus when you're flying, like. So if I'm convinced I've actually found the core, like, and it's a really strong day, it uh -huh. kind of depends, it's not like one rule fits all. Okay. If it's a really strong day, yeah, I'm like banking as hard as I can to make sure that at least part of my wing is staying in that very tight tight core. If it's a, like a really massive thermal, and like no matter where I am, I'm going for the same, same uh, vertical like accelerate, kind of vertical rate, um, I'll do really wide turns, because it's more efficient. Uh, you can get away with doing really back turns if it's like a really strong day. So you just actually have a cork screw up. Yeah. So generally you're looking for efficiency. Got it. I have a follow-up question on this one too. I'm still thinking about that thermal map, and it's true that I guess you don't know anything going into the thermal when you hit it. Yeah. About which way it is, but I've always thought in my mind that unless you're lucky and you just hit smack dab in the middle of it and you get a symmetric entry to it, then the way the glider pitches is going to give you a clue. Yeah, a little right? bit. So yeah, definitely. it's going to pitch away from the core, I would think. Yeah, okay. and that, that, if that definitely. If that happens twice, then you know, hey, the core's got to be over here. You can exploit that and change your direction, or yeah, it's, it's very still a true. bad idea. No, no, that's very true. Okay. Yeah, and like you, you a lot of the time get different feelings. Sometimes you're like your wing will pitch forward and pull you. That's like generally a good idea, a, ge a good sense that you're going into like the stronger parts. Yeah. Okay. If like pitches back like super hard, usually you're on like a sharp edge, yeah. and that's like you know just the front edge hitting the thermal first. Yeah, so I have a follow-up question on this. Yeah. Right? The, the, so this is the, the wind direction, right? Yeah. That we can see from our instrument. So let's say that you fly from this direction, right? Yeah. Uh, your glider kind of, uh, right? Or you fly this direction, right? Your glider is like this. Yeah. So which turn you would hit? You know the wind direction. Yeah. You know you're getting into several something, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, you, you probably turn into wind. Turn into wind, yes. You turn into wind. Yeah, if you're going at an angle, you're generally going to turn yeah. it into wind just because like, it'll give you the best chance of, yeah. of finding it. Because you're always expecting that stronger part of it to be at the, uh, on the upwind side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a really good guy on YouTube. He's called Andre um, Bandera. Yeah. Anybody who's watching? Yeah. yeah, he's amazing. Actually, Mike, Mike has a property. Or Michael, sorry. Mike yeah, has Michael. a property right next to it. Yeah. And they, uh, they go flying together sometimes. He's got amazing videos online, and he... He's very good at explaining it and like you know doing it visually. He does a good job. So to, to try to stimulate, I mean, as you guys are trying to develop your methodology for finding this invisible thermal, there's our thermal, and I'm looking to hear your uh, speak. Yeah. Um, but uh, we don't know where it is. So your objective is to get constant cone, whatever it is to take that glider and put it in the middle and get constant tone. I'll uh, so you grab the, the machine there, so go ahead sure. and tell us what you think. Yeah, so like we say, we can't, we can't see what we're flying into. So yeah, if you're like kind of, you're going through it, it's generally best, actually, I'm, I'm gonna check on this Andre video, because he's, uh, he's really, really good. So as he's pulling that up, and, uh, as, a, uh, as your mother hen here, of the basics that the way uh, I uh, see, is that, well, we're calling this a thermal with sink around it. Right now, we're saying classically, that's what it looks like with a, with, a, with a hot center in the middle. But realize, for starters, it can be uh, not large enough that you really can't even get your glider in, and we call it unorganized, and you really can't get it in. Hopefully, that glider, the uh, thermal is large enough that it dwarfs your glider, and you can put it in. That would be classic on a chalkboard, what it looks like, but realize that it could have another core. It can have any kind of shape. And you're trying to model in your mind where it is and how to get 
that constant tone out of your vario where you're either going up at, 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 at 20 feet per minute and you're waiting for it to get stronger and, uh, and, you, and you stumble into the better part by continually calibrating and migrating your turn. And this is where Superhero is going to give us his play. Um, I'm going to let some of these smart let me do it. So, um, well, you know at all times. There we go. It's pretty much what we just went through here. So when you're flying around, you'll have a variable that will tell you if you're going up or going down. So you know at all times what is happening. Is it minus one? Is it plus one? Plus three? Minus four? So you know at all times uh, if you're going up or going down, but you don't know where the thermals are. All you know is you looked at that number. So if you read some books about this problem, you'll come across this simple rule. So it assumes two things. It assumes that you're coming across and you bump into a thermal, and it also assumes that you're always turning, okay, with uh, some radius. So if you have those two assumptions, there's two things that you can do. If your vario is going up, i.e. if this number is increasing, so minus one, zero, one, that's increasing, you widen the turn. So if you're turning with a certain radius, you make that radius bigger. So more radius. If your vario is going down, you tighten the turn, which means you make that radius smaller. It kind of seems like a bit weird. So let's try it out. Bear in mind, we don't know where this is. We can't see this. Uh, all we know is our vario. So, so let's imagine we're coming here with our paraglider. Doop, 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 doop. And here we bump into plus one and our vario starts to go beep, 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 beep. So we know that we're hitting lift. So as per that rule, if the vario is going up, widen the turn. We're already going straight, so we can't get any wider than that. So we continue going straight. And now we're hitting plus two, so it's going up even more. So it's beep, 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 beep. According to the rule, widen the turn. So we can't go any wider, so we keep going straight. So carry on until something else happens, which is we get to here. When we get to here, it starts going now. So it goes from plus two to plus one. So it's going do, 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 do. So at this point, we need to, if it's going down, tighten the turn. So obviously we have two options. We could go right or we could go left. For argument's sake, let's say we go left. So we start turning here, turning tighter. And as we go past here, it actually goes from plus one to minus one. So it gets even worse. So according to the rule, if it's going down, tighten the turn. So we tighten the turn even more. And we keep turning and we keep turning and keep turning because we're at this rate until we hit this again. So if we hit this again, we're on plus one again, which means it's going up, which means we widen the turn. So again, you can go straight or simply make wider turns. And then you hit plus one again, which means it's going up, which means you widen the turn. Again, we can't really widen anymore because we're already going straight. And then you hit plus three, which means it's going up, which means you widen the turn, which means you can't widen anymore because you're already going straight. <laughs> you start to see a pattern here. So until we get to this point, and now we're going down. So from minus three, uh, it's going from plus three to plus two. So it's going down, so we tighten the turn. Again, it doesn't really matter. We could turn right here and make it worse, but we already we're already turning to this side. So usually when we go into a thermal, we always turn in the same direction. We don't switch around too much. So we continue to go left and we, because it's going down, we tighten the turn and this turn tightens and we get a little bit of this, a, a little bit of plus one, which means it's going down even more, which means we tighten even more and we see ourselves coming back to plus two. So if you go into plus two, it's gone from plus one to plus two, which means it's going up, which means we widen the turn. So we widen the turn, get on three, we get to here, 
we tighten again until we hit three again. And if the thermal is wide enough, we end up basically understanding where it is and we end up there. And then we're going straight up and we are on the most efficient part of the lift. And we go. Wonderful. Is that the system you use? Um, something similar. I just try and use like mental mapping and also like the information the link gives you. But this is like a very basic, cumbersome way of like explaining it. Like we get it's like super long, but like you can see how it kind of homes itself in eventually. It's like the strongest part of the list. So I'm, I'm here to, uh, we're all here to hear how you, because you have a successful pattern. Yeah. And um, an interesting thing, I would kind of speak 180 degrees different to the way he's articulated this, but obviously he's uh, probably has quite a bit of game and I just don't know uh, who he is. So, yeah. um, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, um, okay, so we've seen his migration pattern. We all agree turning the same way and even turning away from, uh, if you uh, make the, the uh, unfortunate decision that as you, uh, as you uh, enter that thermal, and I'm here really to get you talking. Okay, okay. You pulled up somebody who, who put up the time there, but um, mm. let's see if, because I looked at that and I go, well, I wouldn't speak it that way, but I'm, I use, for me, I use more visual orientation, uh, but uh, uh, your, your objective is to do what? Say it. Uh, the, I, I spoke it. Constant, right, get high, but constant tongue. So I'm going to say if that's your objective, then, then, then you're on it. Now how to get there, he spoke of entering, the, uh, entering a thermal, and uh, just be very clear, it might give you a signature like this and push you away. Sometimes it actually sucks you in, and you're going to make a determination on the character of the air and, and so forth as to, where, uh, to uh, uh, how it's talking to you. Uh, and you can make a mistake when it tells you, hey, I'm over here, but you went the other way because who knows, other traffic or terrain, or you, 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 you just like to turn left. And so you initiate and you make your turn. I'm going to really try to get, get him saying what he does. But for me, it's more visual. I'm giving you hints to entirely so you don't have to follow his track. Maybe that will work for you. But there are different methods you can use. For me, I start to turn, and the glider starts, to, the, uh, the variometer starts to wane. And for me, I know that being a recreational pilot, I'm just looking to get constant tone. And I'm going to take the time to let it come around, and I make a note. The sun is over there, and I know that whatever I had is now behind me, and I'm going to make that, I'm going to come around back for it. And in essence, if I'm sinking, yep, I'm probably going to make a little, I'm going to ferret it out over there, and to his credit, I'm going to turn a little bit tighter because I know I want to make my way over there. But I, I certainly make a visual reference that as I'm flying away from it, variometer waning, I want to be over there. And as we make our turn, uh, I will... Uh, 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 make uh, keep my weight shift on, and as I come around with the hunch that it's over that way, I'm going to keep my weight shift on, flatten out my brakes, listen for the variometer to verify. Now it's beep 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 beep. It's starting to go again, and I I care to do just 30 second 30 percent recalibrations on my circle. So I might not get it on the whole on the make my my re, my turn and remeasure. Uh, uh, right spot on, but beep, 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 I got more of it, and now I turn it, I turn on it, and frankly, I might turn a little tighter, you know, once I have it, my, and, uh, and then I say, oh, it's waning a little bit here, but I've, I've got the majority, beep, 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 and I say, I want to recalibrate this way, 30%, because I want to keep 70% of my win until I get to the core, constant tone, all right, when you get constant tone, I want you to think of, Theo and Chirico and, and smile for the rest of your career as you climb up. And you're looking for that constant tone, and that's what you're looking to do all the way around, and of course it'll move. Now, that's my quick speak. We can go sit in the harnesses and turn that thing in around there, but I'm here, or we're all here to hear what do you do, uh, uh, as we've, we've seen a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Yeah, so basically exactly, exactly like Mark says. Um, basically using any kind of references, um, to just be able to create that mental map in your mind. Like, I've got my red blobs, so I, you know, anything that gives me an, an idea of what, what and where the thermal is. So yeah, I'm kind of entering like this. You know, I get pushed back and maybe a little bit tipped to the side. So like, that makes me want to initially turn to the left. Yeah, I'll start turning to the left. And I might drop out a bit. And then yeah, I'm, I'm gonna turn tighter because I know that like, well, whatever it was, it's gonna be behind me. So yeah, I'm turning around, coming back into it. And then yeah, it's pretty much just like what you were saying. 
maintaining that turn, but really trying to hone in on like where the center is. And um, yeah, I, I, I can't really explain that uh, articulately, but yeah, just finding finding the red blobs, man. Just find the red blobs. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, come around and yeah, as soon as you start like feeling that, oh, we might like be getting close to the center. If you've got an idea that the center's over here, just maintain your turn and straighten up a little bit until you like hit that constant tone. And then like you can really try and wang it around. Uh, that's when you can start doing like it's a really tight core. You really like kind of spiral your way up. If it's like a really gentle day and like there's not too much lift, but you can tell there's like a stronger bit of lift right in the middle, just try and try and keep like, you know, half half the wing in it. Like sometimes you need to do like, you know, really bank turns to stay in the thermal, sometimes you can just stay more efficient and go wide. Um, but yeah. I think making notes, like just watching everything around you, um, looking for birds, looking for leaves. Leaves actually like I've had, I've had like a plastic bag hit me in the face a few times, you know, because like, you know, you just down, um, you imagine how, how a thermal is being created, you've got this huge area of like, say, a darker field, surrounded by trees, it lifts up, it lifts up, like, you know, it's going into the air, and it just sucks everything on the ground that's like around that area up into the sky, so like, you can actually see a lot of debris sometimes, that can kind of help you. Is there anything on the ground while you're flying that you might think a thermal would come from? Yeah, so like you're talking triggers. Um, if we take a step towards like triggers, anything that will create like a temperature difference. So like a dark asphalt is like great for absorbing heat from the sun. Uh, like a darker field, uh, that'll do really well. And like even on some days where you've got like a lot of um, a lot of heat hitting the ground, it might not, it might not trigger like um, every time. You might sometimes need like a little bit of wind pushing the this hot, unstable, bubbly air up to like you know a river, which is colder, the air just above it is colder, so it's going to, the cold air is going to come underneath the high air, it's going to separate, and that's what actually releases the thermal. Or like trees as well, like trees, if the wind pushes the thermal into some trees, that will release the thermal too. Tractors, tractors are amazing, you know, like somebody's plowing the field, like I'm always aiming for those guys, because they're always like, they're doing something. I've, there's an amazing video of my mate, he's in a competition in Australia, he's a hang glider pilot, and his dad. Um, goes into this big ass field with a stick and he's tied his shirt to a stick and uh, he's running around in circles like this and uh, he runs around in circles like big enough that it actually disturbs the air, creates a dust devil, his son comes in, takes the thermal and rides it all the way up to the car. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. His name's uh, Ollie Chitty, that's the guy, and then his dad's like, um, yeah, and he's Nick Chitty. But yeah, it's, it's just an awesome video. Okay. It. You guys are all fairly moved along. Abraham, you're you're looking to uh, get sink your teeth more into this. Yes, a sir. common thing for newer pilots when they when they walk into a thermal is that glider heaves back, uh, and we'll say it's a thermal rather than a bit of turbulence. Um, what is your first reaction as you as you walk into something that's that's pretty big? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you just want to kind of maintain um, pitch control, um, just because like you know. <clears throat> When you're in the film, we want to be as like pitch stable, so you're getting like as much um, surface area, kind of showing showing surface to like the, uh, the rising air. So you want to go up as fast as possible. So yeah, maintain like so if it pitches back, just make sure you catch the dive, and you kind of expect that the film is going to be somewhere in front of you. So, you know, like you should be pitching back. Let me give you a little bit more lead on sure. trying to stimulate you. So as a, a, a newer pilots there. Their beginner errors when they walk into into lift is it, it, it is the glider pitches back and they kind of go like this and they keep a straight line go because they haven't gotten wired into what your objectives are to make a climb. So there it is. It wheels you back sure. and uh, you got a little bit more experience now. And uh, and uh, for me, the first thing I start thinking, I'm trying to turn it over to you, yeah. is is that I, I want to get that turn in. And, uh, and, and to get this glider venting off to one side and try to find this invisible thing, especially if it's a strong day, and I don't really want to find what's on the other side. Uh, this could be, well be a penalty, especially when you're first couple minutes of, of, of air and, and uh, you're getting your air legs together, and it does this. And I'll suggest so, that some... Oh uh, yeah, you ready? I, I would actually counter that a little bit. Um, so, you don't want to... It depends on the day. You like get an idea of the, the day. If you're already up at cloud base, you've already had one thermal, you know what like you can expect from a day. Um, a lot of the time I won't turn straight away. I wanna like just go through it and see what it'll bring me. Because a lot of the time, 
I've been in a competition, this is like, you know, maybe a little bit higher level, but you go into a, a thermal, you take the first thing that it gives you, and you're just like, you know, slowly going up, and then everyone comes in above you, goes a little bit further, and they ping out. Like, there's a way stronger bit of lift, the core's actually just in front of you. So I usually just go through it to see if there's, if there's any chance it's gonna get better, and if I drop out, I just do a quick turn, go back and get back into that lift. So I don't actually always turn straight away. I'm like usually just trying to see if it gets any better. And, it, and a lot of time it does. A lot of time you're going into it, it's like beep, 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 and then you can actually like wang it into a turn. Um, yeah, it just kind of depends on the day. And, like, and you spoke having been a comp, and now you're speaking in competition, uh, uh, in competition uh, where you're trying to uh, use a, uh, you have a, a mass of, of play. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to suggest that, uh, that sometimes, uh, again, if you find yourself, Abraham, the newer you're at 25, 30 flights, that that glider's, uh, that that glider's uh, going back. Sometimes we make, a, on, on a big lift day, we, we engage the turning on our glider, and, uh, and we're trying to get that thing ar around. And, and I find myself, if I can get 180 degrees on it, and I, and I haven't breached the perimeter of the thermal, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, because if there's a, now I'm a, a good chance that maybe I can get it all the way around and I have it. When I get two, 270 degrees on that first big thermal, I'm, I'm actually relieved and figuring I've got a very good chance of staying in it as opposed to finding the other side and, and, and taking a hit and not, uh, not being game. Uh, I'll suggest to you that, uh, uh, that uh, when you're turning, for starters, just from a security standpoint, step in there and, and and correct me here, because you're the 2022 future. Um, when you're venting the glider off to the side, uh, that glider is quite happy in, in, in any uh, overage of energy or gyration. It will play this like so. And of course, we wanted all the, all the more in the center of that thermal. If you, if you uh, take her straight on and uh, go starfish, and let her and just fly out the other side without a without a game plan. The glider then can surge forward and and, and, and give you some issues, and maybe you're going to be a little bit more gun shy. You're going to say, "Well, this is a bit much. I, I just want to I just want to run and and and, and uh, have something a little bit more uh, uh, rational." Mm -hmm. uh, remind you that if you can bite into that thermal and. Uh, get that uh, acceleration stabilized. That's to say that the, that moment where where you hit and things change and so forth. To the newer pilot, that's a little uneasy. But remember, if you can if you can lock into it and if you can get constant tone, even if you're going up at a thousand feet per minute, it can be as sweet consistently around a thousand. It can be as sweet as twenty feet per minute around if you've got it locked and you're going up. Um, yeah. Again, I'm, I'm trying to speak a little bit more to the new person as opposed to the competition edge. So we yeah. have the Abraham and we have the Jay and, and a, a few of you guys that are really trying to get it around your head, that next step uh, for uh, going from terrestrial creature where you were on the ground to walking out, into, out there into space and you're trying to get your first five minutes, can you stay up for five minutes and be game and not find yourself down low and, and contemplating dirt versus, you know, making a play to get high? So, yeah. um, no, definitely. So, like, yeah, if you're going to, if you're starting out thermaling, definitely just, like, take whatever you can and, like, just see, see how it goes because, like, all of this is just built on experience. So, you might just, like, you'll pitch up. They'll do a turn, they'll drop out to the side, they'll pitch back down. And then, you know, you'll just kind of be doing a little bit of this until, like, you know, you like, might find your way into the thermal and then, like, um, get a more consistent tone. So, yeah, it's just, just try. Just try your best. Do you ever use speed bar when it pitches back? So, like, yeah. just a little tap? That's, like, a subtlety thing, but, you, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, you sometimes. Can, on these that. ones, because you can, but, like, not on, not on what you guys are playing. Maybe on Cs or Ds. Yeah. Get it back overhead real quick. You don't. You don't need to worry about it too much. Just, just be patient and wait. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But if you're being really aggressive, you can. Yeah. Or if you're like trying to squeeze in between like a bunch of people, but I don't think we'll be doing that here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, just try it. I want like, another like, question. Like, Do you ever use uh, your risers to push off of for weight shift? Like if you want to like 
again, like when, when you're properly coordinating, like you're just, you're right in the center and it's going up like five meters a second, six meters a second, and you're just, you're giving it everything you can just to stay yeah, in okay, there. Like, so, yeah, okay. you can like push it, okay. you, you push against the rise a little bit, but it's Because I find myself doing that sometimes in strong moves. It's not the best practice because um, you lose, you, li you lose tip control on the other yeah, side. Right. So you can't use your brake. Okay. Um, generally, being independent of the risers with your hands, having your hands completely independent of everything else, yeah. um, gives you like just more control. Okay. You see a lot of people that like, one of the worst things you can do is you have to take off. They like use their hands on their brakes to like try and push themselves in the hardest. Sure. Yeah. Like you should never be using your hands to do anything but turning or pitch control and stuff like that. You should really just be keeping them completely independent to the rest of you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. In theory, we got five more minutes. I'd like to see you sit in, uh, like we did the other day, sit in that harness over there. We migrate over there. I got you, you can sit in harnesses. Mark, I got one more question, real quick. So, Theo, like with thermaling, right? Especially with competition, it's all about there's a group think aspect to it, right? Because saw a couple of videos and a bunch of people. Yeah. And clearly, um, you. Like you're the champion, you won, so you definitely had some sort of unfair advantage over the group. So can you, yeah, talk about like were you able to read the thermal first, like based on the landscape, or like were you the first one who found it? Like, so the the biggest thing in, in competitions is like we touched on earlier is thermal, in. and if you can out thermal people, you basically you've done like your best chance and. You know, gliding's a lot more random. Like right. you're flying through the air, you don't know what's going on. But when you're in a film with like, 50, you know, 20, 30, 50, 150 other pilots, there's so much pieces of, like every pilot's there like a bird, like a piece of information. Like you're using them, you're watching them, to give you like, like the biggest like mental map of like what this air is doing around you at that present time. So like you know, if someone's up over there going a little bit faster than you. You should be like on them. You should be like there already. You should, they shouldn't be turning faster than you. You should always be going up at the same rate or like faster than everyone else. Okay. So yeah, it's just like using all that information that you're given to um, to fly as effectively as possible. So you like fully embrace that group think just it's, follow it's the more, part it's more of it rather than like trying to figure out your own. Yeah. Own well. Things. Yeah. It depends. If you're in a position where you can push, like you're at the top of the thermal, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And like, you know, you're basically about to go into the cloud. You're gonna to have to either make a decision to make a move or just like wait for everyone to come up with you, let someone else go for you. And then they, they take all the risk. Gotcha. Um, now that's another thing. It's like risk management when you're flying competitions. Um, Russ Ogden does an amazing interview with um, Nick Grease. Do you guys know Nick Grease? Yeah, it's like really good, done by XC Mag. And he like goes over like his five fundamental aspects of flying. Like the main one, if you're getting into that level, is just like how you can learn from your mistakes. Um, okay. Yeah, just take what you do and think about it afterwards because like, you've not got an instructor there with you the whole time telling you exactly what you did wrong. You're, it's all on you to figure that out. It's all, a, it's all a very personal thing. Do you usually record your competition flying at just, all? Or? Just track logs. And you can okay. go through, you can take like, you know, the top five people's track logs, compare it to yours. and. Huh, yeah. interesting. You Just put it on like, model it and Yeah, you put there's like um there's a bunch of free services online, you can like watch it in real time or like time speed it. So like you can do it like thirty two times or six four times speed and watch like the whole thing go off on like a three D map. It's pretty cool. Awesome. But yeah, I'd say observation and uh, just learning from your mistakes are the biggest thing you can, you can use. Got it. Yeah. Let me indulge Thank you guys you. and have him sit in the harness over here. Let's just see what he actually what, what breaks and how to position himself in the harness. <laughs> he was getting. Um, so yeah, when I'm, uh, when I'm holding my brakes, um, I usually start by taking a half wrap. So I hold the brakes like this, and then I'll wrap around. And I usually have like my index finger just resting on the brake line. And um, I don't know why, but just, that's how I like it. Um, it makes me feel like I have quite a lot of feel going through the brakes. Uh, so I can hear that, that information if my voice is chatting to me, I want to be able to like listen. Um, just ignore the other voices in my head. <laughs> nah, but um, yeah, so uh, you want to like, this is a really um, a good position on your brakes as well because like, you, imagine you want to go for your reserve. Like, you just let go of it and instantly you can go for your reserve. But, like, say if you put your hands through the, through the brakes, grab them like this, or like even worse, like do that. There's like an extra stage of like, 
getting your getting your hands out of your brakes to like actually reach that reserve. And if you want to survive, like, and you're in like the shit, so it's good to have that access. Um, I have to say, 98% of the pros that we're seeing on the GoPros are are using that hand through. But the uh, point is, is uh, yeah. for the guy who never really had to throw his reserve. Uh, um, he's using that as a safety precaution to kind of let it go. Yeah, basically, right. it's just like if you can't help yourself out, you might as well. Um, yeah, when it comes to positioning the harness, this is a lot different to what we fly and we usually fly in a pod. Um, but yeah, if you're just like thinking about weight shifting, does anybody know like, just like the best kind of idea of how to weight shift effectively? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where is it? Where, is, where are you trying to move? Like, what's the hips. part of you? It's all yeah. your hips. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, the hips give you like the best, the best way of doing this. And like one of my friends tried to teach me how to, to salsa, and I, I'm totally shit at it. And I can still move my hips and my harness. Like, even, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, speed bar. Everyone knows generally how to use speed bar. Yeah, just it usually has like one or two or three stages. Yeah, just kind of. Um, I wanted to ask actually in regards to speed bar, do yeah. you is this normal to have trouble with like trying to catch it? Is that a normal uh, setup or is that does that mean if you, if you have trouble getting it, does that mean something's wrong with your fit too tight? Or is it is that a normal thing? Do you guys like, um, try a couple times and then get it? Or? It depends. Oh, it's a, oh, you got shoot. Yeah, that's a really good idea. So like this kind of bungee is can be really helpful. What you can do with this is like, you know, attach a piece of this to your speed bar and then like you can wrap the other side to your foot. So like if you extend your foot like that, oh. you'll actually be able to like grab the speed bar as it comes underneath you. Oh. That's just like one example if the design of the harness isn't good enough that you can't actually reach it when you're trying to like, trying to get it. That's like what Now I know you're interested in speed bar because you found yourself two, in two situations recently. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, but uh, for starters, remember, uh, Ta locating yourself tactically so that you're not in an emergency, you know, mistake, downwind, wind switched on, you know, so forth. Uh, and we'll, we should come back to speed bar. But I have you sitting in the harness right now, and I'd like yeah. you to speak with regard to thermaling. Because right, we're in, we're in April thermals trying to get you guys up. So, so there you are. Uh, uh, we, we have a thermal that's laid out. Yeah. You just kind of walked into something, yeah. and you kind of eased maybe away from it. So. Uh, as you know, I've, you, maybe you took bearing on the sun, yeah. the, the, the thermal that was over here, and there you are starting to starting to ease off there. What might be your posturing here as I might uh, help you here as you find yourself going in the variometer is now waning. Yeah. Your weight shift play, your hand play, what, what might Theo do? So the, the first thing you want to do is obviously like get your hips round, like initiate that turn with the weight shift because like that's the most efficient way, and then start applying your brake. And obviously look at where you're going. And like making a mental note of like what's going on, where the thermal is. All right, so I'm gonna do the beep bit. So it's beep, 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 and I'm like gonna lean even harder and turn even faster, and um, like I'm getting towards the core. It's like beep, 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 beep. So I like turn again quite hard. Beep, 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 and then like as soon as I get that like higher, um, like you know, the constant turn which I'm looking for, like you're really trying to like wang it around basically. So you're, as I got distracted there, your body posturing when you're making your turn looks like the yeah, hands are in close. And you're touching your eyes yeah. too. Yeah, well that's. Do you <laughs> actually have? To, yeah, I'm watching yeah, your hands here. What do you got to show us? Pro tip. So you like your legs crossed, but you're generally in a pod. Yeah. So like, um, leg cross just helps you get that hips up. He's, 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 he, if he's, he's naturally showing. He's, he, his tendency is to have his palm here. If he's really showing it, notice that his arm is kind of tucked in, kind of sweet. His outside hand looks yeah. like right now he's saying palm forward. I bet you might even have a finger on out there. Yeah. And what might be your adjustments to as you uh, you know rock around? How do you actually move in your in your harness? Hand, whatever this that is that it? Um, yeah. So a lot of the um, my weight shift's generally quite stable, and I, I'll do a lot of the um, you know adjustments with with my hands actually. So like because my wings so wide and skinny, um, I can actually do a lot of work um, with just the outside brake. So like, you know, I can kind of almost maintain the, um, the brake pressure on the right and left hand side and I can actually just slow down my turn with the outside brake. Uh, that, I find that quite efficient just because then you kind of maintain that, um, that min sync. Like sometimes, it, you know, if you're flying along normally, you know, your hands are up, you're going at trim speed. Um, that's like, you know, a nice efficient 
just a way of gliding. But like when you're in a film or going slowly, you like pull your brakes a little bit, like just rest your arms. That's almost like minimum sync. It's like the, the, the speed at which you're flying to go down the slowest. Yeah. So like yeah. So I've got like my waist shifts like that. I'm turning. I'm like, I feel like the, um, the thermal is actually just over there. So I'm gonna, you know, pull my brakes down a little bit. So I'm gonna like straighten up almost. I'm still maintaining that curve, just like, you know, straighten up a little bit. And then like, as soon as I'm actually back to where I want to be, I'll just like release the brake again. And then I'll like kind of go back around that turn. Now when you are turning and you're making your brake adjustments, do you generally keep your weight shift on and make brake adjustments? Or do you actually come out of your, your weight shift? No, I'll, I'll usually stay on my weight shift. There you go, we concur. So, so, and uh, we've done, we've done spoken before, sitting in our chalk talks. If, if my, it, as a, see if we we're on the same page if we're if we we have our thermal center there beep, 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 beep. i'm waning away and i'm going you know sun's over there i want to be a little bit more that way and i'll keep my weight shift on and as i come around i go okay i'm expecting to make my adjustment now and for me i'll start to i'll keep the weight shift on and i'll start to level the brakes taking a, a little bit of course in the variable will start to to verify beep, beep 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 and then i decide already weight shifted over boom you know what I mean? And then you're trying to try to, you're already weight shifted. It's already cocked like a slingshot. Throw that hand up and then you, 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 you see if you've got a better hunk of it. So. That's a good way of explaining that. Yeah. Okay. All right. There you go. You did it perfectly. You did, did Perfect. Perfection. Uh, how much pressure on the opposite hand? Let's say turning right. What's, what do you do with the left? Like just kind of. Just, just, just like feel it. Maybe uh, like, yeah. When you're, when you're like trying to search or like you're in the actual core, like um, just like the weight of your arm. Gotcha. Not, not too much more. Okay. If you need to, if it's like pitching a lot and you need to pull some right. like side brake just to correct it, you can put like a decent amount. But yeah, you just want to make sure you're not like, you know, pushing too much and stall the glider or spin it. Got it. Because, um, yeah. How much are you concerned about location in the thermal versus flying slow in the thermal? Um, I mean, you're always trying to like maintain your pitch stability, but like, honestly, if you're in the right part of the thermal, you won't be worrying about that too much. You're just going to be. You like, won't be worrying about. Um, yeah, you won't be worrying about the speed as much. You want to just kind of be flying into the thermal. Like the thermal position is definitely the most important part. There you go. Location, location, <laughs> centering yourself, and 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 getting that 800 feet per minute thermal and locating yourself there. To be clear has a lot more merit than trying to slow your glider down and get 20 or 30 feet per minute better sink rate location. That's that you're talking about hundreds of feet per minute lift versus a little being preoccupied with, with your speed. Hopefully you're, you're just trying to dial in on the center of that. And, and we've been speaking a lot really about this as if you're flying by yourself. We could then probably go into a little bit about when you're flying with another person and, and having the advantage of, of flying with someone or a gaggle of people where it's 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 more definitively marked. It's true. It's wonderful. Yep, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's Questions good. here as we've now reached noon. I mean, we can easily go longer. We have sun up. I am prepared to, to drive you guys up. Go. But uh, you're, you're now thinking, no, 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 this is a good moment. Take advantage, ask another question. <laughs> Yeah, Mark's got, Mark does a very good job of like articulating like the actual uh, the theory behind it. I'm I'm still working on it, guys. So just bear with me whilst I'm doing it. Oh, we appreciate it. In regards to uh, one question, in regards to Ryan's um, point, in regards to like, because. When I'm trying to turn, I, I, I try to look for, maybe it's my position, maybe it's my hardness, I try to look for any sort of leverage to push. So is it a good practice to put your hand on the risers when you're turning? Does, is, is it, does that matter? Uh, no, generally try and avoid touching anything that um, okay. isn't your brakes. Unless you're on speed bar and you're using the rear risers. Gotcha. That's kind of like okay. the only time where you're going to be touching stuff that's not just your brakes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, some people, you can't like do that. It's not, it's just not the best idea. Got it. Yeah. Usually, you can get most of it in like your hips. Even if you're getting thrown out, huh. just like, you know, try and really look. Like, see. That should help you. Yeah, I'll okay. try and whip your eyes into that like, kind of position. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? We're good. We're awesome. good flying. Nice. That's it. A round of applause for Theo Morgan and his uh, overseer, Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Theo.
All right, good job. All right, uh, so listen, guys, it does, the sky looks much better than I thought. Yep, if you want, we can organize to go up.